Hey everyone, uh, welcome and good evening. My name is John Doyle and we're gonna bring together the uh, January meeting, first meeting of 2021 of City Island Rising. I wanna thank everyone for being with us tonight. We have a full program. Everyone should see the agenda in the chat as we uh, start off the meeting here. If you have any questions, feel free to chat me, uh, Beverly Jones, uh, or any other member of our board who's on here. Uh, we're gonna make it so we're gonna get through a few presentations early and that's gonna free up a lot of time for conversation about things that need to be improved in the community. And that's the most important part of the meeting because we wanna hear from all of you. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm gonna start off introducing our first guest who has done a lot of great work addressing some of the um, food inequity issues that people are going through. Uh, somewhat that has been accelerated before uh, during COVID-19, but to be honest, a lot of people have been suffering from before COVID-19 as well. And so filling that gap uh, in a way that's very selfless and you can often see her out and late at night stocking the fridge on the corner of City Island and Schofield Street uh, and uh, maintaining the food network for the South Bronx overall. So uh, without carrying on any further, Ariadna Phillips, uh, thank you and the floor is yours. Hi, John, thank you so much. Um, and I also wanna mention here with me is another one of my lead organizers, uh, David Arvello, is also one of our leads with uh, Anchor Fridge and South Bronx Mutual Aid. Uh, let's see, we have Dan Triber here as well. So I, you know, I do wanna give a shout out and a big thank you to some of the folks that I see on here uh, that have been organizing with us. So I'll, let's see, I'll share my screen with you guys. All right, so a little bit of background on who we are. So my name is Ariadna Phillips. I've been an educator in the Bronx since 2003. Uh, I came to the Bronx immediately after graduating from college. I'm a, a public school teacher in bilingual education, computer science, and a very long story short, I've been involved with a lot of volunteer work and community organizing, um, just in the nature of being an educator. But when the pandemic hit, it became clear that we needed to do more to fill in the gaps for the community that I teach in, which is in Mott Haven and the South Bronx. Um, but I'm a resident here in City Island. So South Bronx Mutual Aid was basically a volunteer group of friends we came together, uh, the planning happened between March and April. We officially started work in April and began doing food distributions, uh, primarily in the Bronx and Mount Haven. And then as the, as the pandemic got worse and worse, we realized that we needed some differing infrastructure for how we were getting food out into community. Um, I was thankful to be getting a lot of prepared meals and meals that were perishable and food items that were perishable getting donated to us, but it meant running around very quickly to get it out into the community. And so some of the work that I noticed happening were friends of mine were engaged in starting community fridges. And so as I you know, connected with some folks over the course of the pandemic and some of our work in the mutual aid, I realized that this was something that we could start bringing to more communities. And so, you know, being a resident here on the island, one of the adages in the community fridge world is, you know, put up a fridge in your own neighborhood, right? Around your own corner. You want it to be somewhere where you're connected, you're close to home, and it's something that you feel you can continue to facilitate because um, as John pointed out, it can involve a lot of, a lot of love and labor and making sure that that fridge is taken care of. So a quick background on community fridges. It is, you know, it's a free fridge. It is generally outdoors. It's organized by neighbors and it's stocked with free donated food. And depending on the fridge and whether it has a pantry, they're usually dry goods, personal supplies as well that are offered to the community. So whoever the organizers are, there's no deputizing system. It's just neighbors helping neighbors that will uh, either find a fridge or donate a fridge or purchase a fridge. There are a lot of different ways that people come about the fridge, but they'll usually connect um, with a business in their community, or it could be a, a nonprofit, a, a place of worship, somewhere where they're going to make available an, uh, an electricity source 
um, and hopefully have enough space to build a little enclosure to protect it from the elements. And then the neighbors are the folks that are responsible for cleaning the fridge, stocking the fridge and organizing the community around whether it's food safety issues, labeling issues, or making sure that there's a continuing stream of donations coming into the fridge. Uh, one thing that tends to surprise people when I tell them there are over 80 community fridges in New York City that were founded in this last year during the pandemic. In fact, most were in response to the pandemic. So sometimes they'll say, oh, I, I think I saw one on the news. I'm like you probably did. There are now, I think, 86 of us. Um, so we're, we're popping up all over. So that's anchor fridge on the left. Uh, that's a fully stocked fridge in the South Bronx on the right. And a lot of times when, when you see us in the community fridge world, we actually try to be neighborly with not only our own neighbors, but the other community fridges that are our neighbors. So something again, John referenced is I'm often running around with other members of our volunteer group because we're not just stocking our fridge, we're stocking all of the community fridges in the Bronx uh, and as much as we can upper Manhattan as well. So on our, our Instagram pages, we'll post that information because people very actively watch the, the Instagram stories. They know as soon as the fridge is full is the time to come and visit and pick up uh, meals or food. So this is a map to give you some idea of the density of community fridges. So there's Anchor Fridge all the way out east on its own. Um, we are a community fridge that is serving a lot of people. Sometimes people are surprised when I tell them that Anchor Fridge is located in the city island. And they're like, really? You know, do, do folks really need a community fridge out there? I said, absolutely, because we are all the way out here. We definitely have folks in our community that benefit from using the fridge. We have people that work in our community that also benefit from utilizing the fridge. It's nice to feel cared for by your neighbors. Um, but as you can also see, we are the only fridge in our vicinity of the Bronx. There's more concentration of fridges uh, in upper Manhattan and in the South Bronx, but we are a bit isolated where we are. So it has come to be a, a wonderful oasis as perhaps it feels like City Island often is. It's been a wonderful oasis for folks in the pandemic to know there are neighbors caring for their needs uh, and that they can have support here at the community fridge and pantry. So one thing that our group also does in addition to stocking the community fridges, we also do public distributions. So uh, we've been popping up and doing food distributions all over the Bronx and now upper Manhattan. Uh, the image on the left, that was a distribution in the Fordham area. It was just one day and just a few hours, we distributed 800 bags and boxes of food out to the community um, in partnership with a number of other community groups. Um, our more recent distributions, we've done one on December 22nd. Um, we did visits to homes on the 24th and the 25th. So those were mobile distributions, January 1st, January 6th, and just this past weekend uh, on Sunday. On average, we tend to distribute when it's a public distribution, somewhere between a ton to two and a half, I think our cap is three tons of food and personal care supplies clothing and home goods items directly to the community. Everything is free, publicly available. We don't ask for anything in particular. We just hope that folks get what they need uh, again. And that's completely volunteer driven. So if people feel inspired to join us as, as much as they would like to, um, I'm absolutely going to put a call to action. If anyone here would like to get involved, I'll, I'll share the link in the chat. So uh, that tiny URL for Anchor Fridge Crew is, um, it leads you to a form for folks that might be interested in volunteering with us. Uh, I'm also going to list my email address. So info at southbronxmutualaid.com or my phone directly is here 212-920-6570. And in general, the types of work or labor that we could use some support for from our volunteers we always love folks to come by that are willing to clean the fridge on a regular basis. And we can provide the cleaning supplies. It's simply checking in on the fridge, making sure that if there is anything that shouldn't be in there, that it gets cleared out. We do ask that food get labeled with things like preparation date, um, 
what ingredients were in it and what it is, if it is prepared or if it's not distinctive on the packaging and not produce. So we do remove anything that it's not clear, you know, what that may be just for food safety reasons. Uh, and, you know, once produce gets to a certain point, we have some wonderful neighbors on the island that help us with composting, which we are so grateful for. Um, so we just need folks to clear any of that out on a regular basis. Oftentimes it's me. Uh, so you might see me or David there at the fridge or Dan taking care of that, but we'd love to have more folks that are involved on the island. Um, we also have a few community food partners that are now regularly donating food to us throughout the week. So having help um, right now, our main days are Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. So folks that might be willing to drive uh, within the area to pick up some of those uh, food donations, that would be super helpful. Most of our food partners are within a 15 minute drive. We do have ones that are further, but if you're just getting started, a 15 minute drive in each direction, I think is the ask. Um, if there are people that wanna be more involved beyond that, like I said, there is a wider community fridge network that is heavily utilized, food turns over quickly. So if folks are interested in helping restock more than one community fridge, we work in partnership with all of the other community fridges in the Bronx and upper Manhattan. So we'd love to have folks get more involved if that's of interest to them. And finally, building food distribution partnerships. So that can be with restaurants, that can be with a house of worship or a community center or an area where someone says, hey, we would just like you to pop up and, and do a distribution here. We'd love to hear that. So if there are folks that specifically would like us to come by uh, in relation to the mutual aid and just help distribute some of what we have, we'd love to share. All right. Ariadna, thank you so much. That was uh, that was quite the presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? If you can, please just use the, the hand function and we'll unmute you and call on you. Dan, go ahead. Um, just real quick, um, Ariadna does, um, thank you, Ariadna. She does um, too much, let's just be honest. Um, so what we probably need um, more than anything else, um, are people to drive and pick up food and bring it back. Um, so lots of people are willing to help clean, which is awesome. It's all really helpful. Um, but there are endless times where there are mess where there's a message saying, can you go pick up X from Y? And it happens all the time. And there's not enough people driving the food around, which is even, which is worlds more helpful than just putting something in the fridge. So everything is appreciated. Um, but just from witnessing it over the last month, um, if anyone has the time to do some driving and to do some pickup and delivery, whether it's just the anchor fridge or multiple fridges, um, it's probably the most important thing um, that is needed um, that, that people will sheepishly not ask for. But um, just to be upfront, that would be really helpful. Other, uh, that's all. I'm just noticing it looks like my tiny URL went to sleep. So I'll drop the, the direct link to the volunteer form. It's an air table. And then I'll also, if you could please put in um, Ariana's group, the South Bronx Mutual Aid Network also accepts donations. Mm -hmm. So there is always a way to be helpful. If you don't, if you can't donate time, which Dan is 100% right to bring up, then you can always donate money, which is also helpful. So um, please, Ariadna, if you could include that, so we can, uh, you know, find each each one to be supportive as they can. Thanks, John. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Does anyone else have a question for Ariadna? They'd like to, oh, Joanne Valletta, go ahead. Hold on. Can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Okay. Um, um, we might be, uh, my husband and I probably will be able to pick up some food delivery. So I'll send you uh, our information. And um, I wanted to know about the clothes. People are always asking me uh, who takes donations for clothes. So how does that work with your program? Should sure. So um, I, I literally live here on the island. So if you want to shoot me an email to the info at South Bronx Mutual Aid, or uh, I don't mind putting my, my number here uh, if folks need to get in touch with me. Um, you can just give me a call and I can either pick up from you or if you want to drop off to me on the island, 
I'm local, um, happy to do that. And so we, if anything needs to be washed or cleaned, uh, happy to take care of that. And then we take it straight to distribution. So I tell folks, if you wanna see your donation in action, feel free to come by. Um, we, we do love to have volunteers, but yeah, we, we turn everything around pretty quickly. As soon as clothing is donated to us, we usually have a home for it within a matter of days. So we're, oh, okay. getting, we're getting a lot of requests right now for winter clothing, uh, both men's and women's, children's clothing, infant supplies. I'm getting a lot of requests for infant supplies, diapers, formula, et cetera. So if you can imagine that somebody needs it, um, as a as an essential purchase or an essential thing to have right now, we get requests for it, and like I said, we we usually give it a home within a matter of days. Okay, very good. We'll see what we could do. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Joanne's a good person to talk to. She's always helping people with their uh, with needs they may have. <laughs> and then, if you notice, uh, we'll we'll get you. There are a few other questions that are coming in here. Uh, does anyone have a question, uh, an additional question rather, for Ariadna before we move on to the next presentation? Okay, all right. Uh, with, thank you very much, Ariadna. And I know you're gonna stay on the call for a little bit, right? Good, yes. and, and please remind me, I will sign up for one of those volunteer shifts to help. You, you've got me, you hooked me. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, so we will do that. And then, um, and, and also thank you to Dan, Dan and Rena. Uh, they actually host the Anchor Fridge, which can, sometimes can be a, uh, a lot to take on, but it is serving an incredible need for the community. So everybody just please, when you see them, please thank them because they're helping out as well. And it is something that is serving a lot of people who are in need right now. And we can all do more to help those in need. So thank you for that. Um, Michael, are you ready to go, sir? Absolutely. Great, so um, our next guest speaker is on a topic that I know has been an on and off concern for City Islanders. What we're gonna try to do this year that's uh, different than last year is please email us if you have a topic of concern uh, or you have anything you wanna kind of bring to the forefront. Something that's been coming up a lot lately has been uh, the utility lines. As people know, every time it gets windy or rainy, we have issues either with Optimum, with, with, with uh, Con Ed, with some other uh, utility lines. We did have a small fire on the utility lines in uh, December. Uh, that's why you saw all the Con Ed trucks out here for like two weeks uh, thereafter. Uh, they're saying it wasn't their lines, it was another line regardless. Uh, it's opened up a discussion about how we you know, get our utilities, how we get our, uh, our power. And Michael is a part of a team uh, that is working on a new proposal uh, with the state legislature. And rather than me try to explain it, because I don't know it as well as he does, let's let Michael explain it. So without further ado, uh, Michael, please take it away. Thanks so much, John. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for, for having me. Um, so um, just going to share my screen. So um, uh, thanks again, and thank you, John. Uh, my name is Mike Paulson. Um, I am a volunteer with the Public Power New York Coalition. We're a statewide coalition of many different groups. And um, our uh, campaign is to win public power in New York State. And what does that mean? It essentially means um, taking our um, energy system in New York State, which is largely privately owned and for profit, and bringing it uh, into public ownership and public control. Um, so I'm gonna let you all know a little bit about why uh, we might want to do something like that and how you can get involved. Um, so I'm just gonna run through essentially what we see as difficulties with the current system, some of which I'm sure are very obvious to you already. Um, I'll talk a little bit about public power and what that means and the organizing that we're uh, doing right now to try to win and how you can get involved in it. So, hmm. there we go. Okay, um, so um, 
we see the energy system primarily through Con Ed here in the city. And uh, we know a lot of not so nice things about it. Um, it is dangerous, negligent, and unreliable. Uh, it is extracting quite a lot of wealth from our communities. It treats different neighborhoods unequally, as I'm sure you know in City Island, um, and it is not accountable to us as far as how they operate. Um, so I'll go into a little detail on those. Um, dangerous and negligent um, in many different ways. Um, we've seen explosions, I if you remember this in Astoria, pretty scary. Um, transit breakdowns, they do supply the MTA, and if you're stuck for an hour, they could be why. Of course, the big one is blackouts, and um, as you all probably know, there were some terrible blackouts in the summer in particularly the North and Northeast Bronx. Um, and I know you suffer from them on City Island, um, particularly with weather. Um, so there's that on the much larger scale, um, Con Ed is contributing to climate change in that uh, they are keeping us locked into um, natural gas infrastructure. Why? Because that's profitable for them. Um, and as you can see here, we're, we're still, you know, in the single digits as to renewable energy in New York, which is pretty shocking given what we know. Um, second, um, the extraction of money. Um, they uh, take in over a billion dollars in profits per year, but as uh, many of you know, uh, they recently raised everyone's rates on top of that. And we know that it was already affordable because they're sending out millions of shutoff notices to people who are on the verge of not being able to pay. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge, hugely profitable enterprise for them. Um, thirdly, uh, Con Ed does not treat all New Yorkers the same way. Um, obviously, you know that as I, as, as I mentioned in terms of City Island and the difficulties you've had getting the service and the upgrades that you need. Um, to take another, you know, example, a couple of summers ago, um, they shut off power for a huge number of people in Southeast Brooklyn. Um, you know, because they thought, oh, we need to keep the strain off of the system. But where are they keeping the strain off? You know, they're keeping it off in, in, in Manhattan and, and in more wealthy neighborhoods by sacrificing people in lower income neighborhoods and uh, especially black and brown neighborhoods. Um, lastly, all of the above is able to happen because Con Ed is not accountable to us. Um, Con Ed's boss is its shareholders. It is not the everyday New Yorkers who are in fact paying them to exist. Um, and their only goal is to make profit. Um, it, it doesn't matter how well you like your service or if you're safe. Um, so our opinion is we should not be paying more and more for a system that is giving us less and less and is, is a danger to us. So um, what we advocate is moving towards a model of public power. Um, so broadly speaking, uh, three points for what that means. Um, First, it's public ownership and democratic control of the energy grid, both in how it's produced um, and then ultimately how it's distributed through utilities like Con Edison. Secondly, um, to treat energy as a human right that's guaranteed to everyone, not a, you know, a commodity that some people can afford and other people can't, but a guarantee. And lastly, um, without this whole profit motive, to be able to make the grid safer, more reliable, and as soon as possible, 100% renewable. So um, a few other more specific benefits, public utilities are usually significantly lower rates um, than private, um, fewer and shorter blackouts. And very importantly, I think all of the money that it generates because it's not going to shareholders, it can be reinvested back into the communities for all of the services that are terribly cut in New York State, like schools, hospitals, transport, all of that. Um, this is not a new idea. It's not even what I'd call a radical idea. Um, it is uh, very commonplace, uh, over 2,000 communities uh, in the US, the entire state of Nebraska, for example, and then many other states are pushing for it uh, right now as you know these, these systems get worse. Um, so, the last thing I will say um, is uh, about our actual fight to win public power. And uh, if you want, there's certainly more specifics in the two links I dropped. The first is our campaign website. And the second one is if you wanna get a little bit wonky, um, it goes into detail for the two bills we're introducing this year. Um, so how do we win? First of all, we need to educate um, our communities about this because you know I started working on this two years ago. Before that, I'd never heard of this and never thought about it. 
Um, but this really impacts every single New Yorker. Um, so public education. Also building alliances uh, among community and grassroots groups like uh, City Island Rising. This is why I'm here, of course. Um, and then ultimately to push our electeds to support public power and to pass uh, legislation that will make it a reality. Um, so again, not gonna go too wonky on the bills, um, but we are introducing two bills um, that should be introduced in uh, early February, um, both to expand the state's capacity to um, generate uh, much more renewable energy, and then uh, to actually take over the private utility system and bring it under public uh, and democratic control and ownership. Um, so as I said, we're part of a large coalition. So certainly a bunch of groups here in the city, um, but also you know all different areas of upstate and, and growing. And ultimately we think the time for this is right now. Um, the, the campaign and the idea is really gathering momentum and you know, every summer things get worse. And you know, not just the summer. And electives are starting to take notice of this and starting to see, you know, people are gonna demand something better because we don't need it to be this way. So I'll leave you with a few ways to get involved. Um, you can actually sign up to volunteer um, at publicpower.nyc. Um, we are reaching out to different uh, organizations to sign on to an organizational letter um, to electives to support public power. So that's something um, you might consider as a group. And then uh, once the bills are introduced, um, you can really make a difference reaching out to your elected officials um, on City Island and urging them to sponsor um, the bills. And we'll certainly follow up with, uh, with John about that. There's the website again. And um, if, if you wanted to follow up with me or get any additional info, um, that's my email. And I'll also throw into the chat afterwards. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, happy to take some questions if there's time. Yeah, go ahead. Anyone have a question for, for Michael? Obviously it was a very uh, detailed oriented uh, presentation. Uh, Michael, maybe you could go into, you know, theoretically of course, cause this is all, a, you know, it, it's based on something practical, but you know, this is a possibility thing. It's a hypothetical right now. If we were to go to public power, what could that do to our utility lines that are currently within Pelham Bay Park that we're obviously having problems with? Yeah, so basically, um, so it's the legislation itself doesn't, it doesn't go down to the level of detail of determining, um, you know, changes to the systems in particular neighborhoods. Um, but uh, I would say there are two main elements that um, would be relevant. The first is, um, you know, I said a few times publicly on the democratically controlled. The democratic part is just as important. Um, so um, we're looking to institute um, an elected board um, to, uh, to run the utility. Um, that would be by different regions um, around the state. So that basically you would elect a person to advocate for you and you would be able to hold them accountable by sending them packing, which right now, you probably don't know who's in charge um, because you don't get to choose them. Um, so that's one. The other is um, ultimately it's about removing the profit motive. So Con Ed, it's in their interest to say, you know what, it's not it's not feasible for us to do this because it's going to cost money. Um, but the the thing about public power is the only purpose it serves is to serve the public benefit. So. Um, you're not going to have, you know, I, I can't tell you right now, okay, well, X will happen, uh, you know, in this area, but um, the, the idea is people will start looking at it as what do people need as opposed to like, what can we extract from the public, if that makes sense. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So we'd be electing people to fight for us on that board. Now, do you feel that your push of public power is why they're actually considering putting a lot of these lines underground now that the, the pressure has bubbled up to such a point that people aren't going to take it anymore? I think uh, they, they're starting to see the writing on the wall. Um, this is it is also kind of a national movement. Um, there are campaigns in uh, in Boston, in Chicago, throughout the entire state of California. Um, and, you know, we know that we, we know that Conet has actually been calling and polling people about this. So they're certainly feeling the heat there. Um, and, you know, 
any, any change we can make just by pressuring them is also good, um, even if it doesn't take us all the way there. And I just see a question in the chat um, about the, um, the bills. So we did introduce bills last year, but they've been rewritten. So there, there aren't any bill numbers yet, um, but I will definitely communicate those um, to John as soon as they're numbered. Great, Michael, uh, does anyone else have a question for Michael before we move on? I was, I had a question. Go ahead, William. Michael, I was curious, what alternative uh, sources of energy, energy do you think should be, would be more explored, do you think, when uh, to replace gas and electricity? So that, this, that's definitely, I'm, I'm not much of a, uh, you know, policy expert, but uh, mo most people will tell me that uh, drastically expanding wind is has the highest potential in this part of the country. It's not like Arizona where you can, you know, get a ton of uh, solar energy, although that will be a part of it. But uh, wind, and then there are a number of experimental technologies that are just kind of starting to take off, like geothermal heating for um, houses that where you get uh, heat directly from the heat of the earth, as opposed to having to bring anything from outside. Okay, thank you. Okay. William, thank you for that question. Uh, very, very thoughtful. Um, last call on questions for Michael. I was just gonna oh. say thank you to Michael. Uh, I'm a science teacher and I was literally talking about the contributions to climate change and our current uh, electricity infrastructure. And so I, I just appreciated the timeliness of this. My students are, are literally doing a project about this right now. And, uh, and the importance of transitioning away from some of our, our current uh, carbon emission uh, founding ways in, in creating electricity. So thank you, sir. Thanks for well, this. Thank, thank you. And I'm, I'm right near the Dykeman uh, fridge and I, I know some people who work on that. So they okay. all fit together, right? Electric and fridges. I hear and that. Hand. I hear that. And this will be on YouTube. You can share it with your students if you want. There you go. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm just gonna switch over to my laptop for the third presentation and then we're gonna go right to interactive discussion after that. So hold on one second, everybody. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. And let me uh, turn this off for a second here, hold on. Not trying to do a horror movie for everybody uh, right now. So I'm gonna share my screen so you can all see what I see. And we're going to take this right from the top here. Okay, so this is our presentation for Pelham Bay Park Community Solutions. Uh, again, this is meant to be interactive. So all questions at the end, we will uh, we'll take and we'll make them as, uh, you know, as, as much as we can really, because I think this one is going to get a lot of people uh, going. Uh, so basically, I want to give everybody some background. In the fall, members of City Island Rising met with representatives from the Transportation Alternative Group. Uh, uh, Kevin Diola is on the call right now. Actually, he's biking, so you can actually see him biking on his video. So you know, he's very hardcore about his biking, and we appreciate that. And we met to discuss improvements that could be made for, uh, you know, kind of pedestrian, cyclists, and, and, and motorists all alike. Um, earlier this summer, unfortunately, there was another fatal accident within Pelham Bay Park right by the bridge. A ghost bike is now there. Uh, again, this is the second ghost bike we see in the community itself. There's one at the entryway right after you get off the bridge. And then there's another one um, by the Rodman's Neck Circle on City Island Road. And that's dedicated, of course, to Gabriela Aguilar uh, Valenos, who was the um, service worker who worked, I believe, at Sammy's. Um, unfortunately, she got off her shift early. She had ridden her bike because she couldn't rely on public transportation. Uh, we all know. Uh, how dangerous Pelham Bay Park is, particularly at nighttime. She got on her bike and unfortunately she was struck by a driver who then fled the scene. Uh, eventually, I believe he, he, he served time for that, but you know, the other bike is donated, uh, is dedicated rather to her honor. And Kevin does a great job of making sure that there's a memorial service for everyone who loses their life because of a, uh, because of a, a, a car, uh, uh, a vehicular strike. Um, 
Uh, since that time, we've also spoken with the friends. I've spoken to a few people, Transportation Alternatives, we have, and then we also spoke to a few people at uh, the Friends of Pelham Bay Park Group, which is the volunteer group that helps maintain the park. So these are the volunteers, not the Pelham Bay Park administrators. I just want to make that clear about what changes can be made to better serve everyone. Uh, change number one is speed limit signs. This may sound uh, simple, but as we all know, because we all live on City Island, if you're in a place to go and there's not a lot of traffic, you are accelerating to uh, make up some time. And unfortunately, that, that leaves you very susceptible to, you know, kind of uh, not just speeding, but also, you know, again, we, we've seen in our uh, the bollards that are frequently knocked down. I'm going to get to that a little bit later on in the presentation. We've also seen the 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 uh, the guardrails uh, have have suffered some accidents. So we feel that speed limit signs could serve a better purpose to uh, remind people to slow down, and uh, that the speed limit actually within the park is not uh, you know 40 miles an hour shouldn't be rather, because uh, obviously there's a lot of accidents going on there. Uh, this was an area that was of most concern to the uh, to the cyclists, to pedestrians, and I don't think this is a surprise. Anyone who lives on City Island knows this. This is the turn for, from the Pelham Bay Bridge. Uh, there's a light towards the left of this photo, but towards the right, which is the frequent one we're making, the frequent one that visitors are also uh, to the island are also uh, making. It's it's not a very controlled intersection, and it can be very dangerous because people, you know, may be speeding. So we're asking that they consider some uh, you know, changes to here to this particular roadway to make it safer for everyone who wants to use it and uh, you know, really kind of uh, examine possibly putting some sort of protection between the turn there and the uh, you know, kind of a guardrail or something or a pedestrian barrier between uh, right there on that corner as people turn onto City Island Road. That was something they really wanted. And I, I think it would, serve everyone because I know I ride my bike, I walk through the park sometimes, particularly as it gets nicer out. And I think we all share the goal that we want everyone to be safe in the park, no matter who you are. Uh, better crossings. Uh, here are the uh, bollards at one of our lovely uh, uh, crossing points right off of City Island Road. I think as we have all noticed by now, every time you go off City Island Road, the bollards are in a different position different formations because they are frequently getting hit. This is a sign that the area is not quite safe. Uh, I know we all have photos like this. I know many of you have sent me many photos like this, which I pass along. So one suggestion would be either pedestrian activated light, but really leaving it up to DOT because we recognize we're not traffic experts, uh, but to put something, uh, to, put, to have some sort of redesign to better manage these heavily trafficked uh, intersections. And this would be again, towards the east side of the city on bridge, along Park Drive by the entryway of Orchard Beach. We've all seen that. And towards the on and off ramp of the Hutchinson River Parkway at Bartow Circle. That's another point. We frequently see people there on the bridle path as they're, um, as they're you know, using their uh, kind of uh, riding horses and whatnot. So we all know kind of where the pressure points are, uh, where man meets machine. And we all know at some level we have to do better. So we're trying to highlight these things. So hopefully DOT can come up with some solutions for us. Um, these are bike, uh, you know, people have asked for protected bike lanes before. Um, as I went digging, I found multiple city um, documents that show at least at some level bike lanes have been advertised for the Sea on Bridge, even though I know they are not there right now. Uh, you know, and we are continuing to push for them, you know, if they're advertising that there are bike lanes and protected bike lanes, then they should be protected bike lanes. And as you can see, this is right from DO, one of DOT's reports. There was another one in the Regional Plan Association, and there's another one where they're projecting bike lanes further out into the years. And uh, they're usually, they're saying, oh, look what we got done. And we're listed in the, in the done box or the check box, and we're not. So uh, cause for concern, we, you know, as, as they say in the world, we have the receipts, so we have them together, and we've asked, you know, for some clarifications uh, from the city agencies. Okay, so this is the exit off exit five, and in the photo on the left, as you can see, this is the where people are getting off at exit five, and they're making that sharp left turn, and it, you know, it's led to several accidents. Uh, what you see on the right there is remnants from one of the accidents. This was taken recently, so that wreckage is probably still right there. Um, but as you can see in the photo on the left, there's a lot of tire marks there. A few years back, we actually got them to close off the exit 
and then eventually, oh, not to close off, but to put a no U-turn sign, uh, which did help some, but they really need to consider closing off this exit. Again, people can just go up the road, get on the U-turn, go around, and then come back. And that would be safer for everyone, because what we're having right now is that people are getting off of exit five at two different places. And then if you're making the hard left turn, you're converging without anyone seeing you. And you're going fast because you're coming off the hutch. And it's really creating a dangerous situation. And uh, you know, again, I know we all share that we wanna see it get addressed. Uh, roadway repairs, this is something that Liam has brought up many times uh, that I know we're all familiar with and we have put in for some road repairs in the past, but we need a lot of the roads within the park to be resurfaced. And this is beyond just Shore Road, which, you know, a different activist, uh, the, the Shore Road, the, the Breen brothers have been doing a great job of advocating for. This is out separate and apart from that. Um, but we need, you know, City Island Road's gotta be repaved. Uh, the traffic circle that needs to be repaved because everybody knows you, you met with those big potholes as you come right off of Rodman's Neck Circle there. Um, and, you know, we've been putting them in uh, DOT's response would, has been so far they would not resurface, but they would investigate making more robust repairs. I, again, you know, these are things we all need to advocate for. So please speak to your elected officials, speak, you know, call 311. You can even send us emails after you call 311 and we will continue to pass them along because this is a, a neighborhood and residency and, and you know, a city island advocacy organization. Uh, deer signs, as, as many of you know, this has been a cause of mine for about 10 years, and we have gotten some deer signs. Uh, the, si the, the photo on the left illustrates where the signs have been for the last year in the black or where they are, where you will see a deer sign if you're out there. But the ones in red are the ones where we kind of need them. So we need, we need a deer sign over by, um, uh, obviously over by the Palm Bay Bridge to alert people who come that way that there are deer in the park. And we also need them as you get on and off the Hutchinson River Parkway. This photo was actually taken right at the ramps that are even further to the one in the uh, further left than the one in the two, where they were uh, uh, kind of uh, traveling. So you know we're trying to pass this along because this is something we do need DOT to act on. It is a super concern for everybody, and uh, you know we'll continue to advocate on that. I know when Commissioner Lopez came to the group uh, a little over a year ago, he heard about this. So we're, we're continuing to push on this and it's something that, uh, you know, again, needs to happen to improve safety for everyone. Uh, this is just another example. Uh, the, the bike path by the Hutchinson River Parkway, this is as you're getting onto the Hutch northbound, is very unprotected. People are speeding because they're trying to meet the, the Hutch right there and you need to merge inward and, and it, it, it's a problem. So they would like to see additional protections there. That didn't strike me as anything problematic that we couldn't support. And then finally, uh, as you see here, they want better bike crossings along the trail. So this would be something that would probably have to go through the community board as well. But to the extent that you know it goes to the Palm Bay Park and a lot of city islanders do ride their bikes. I have family members who are often on their bikes. Uh, you know, we, should, uh, we should be supportive of that because again, as, as we kind of transition, people are going to need to be riding their bikes more. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right, so with that, I'm gonna open it up. If people have any questions, comments, or concerns, I'm gonna switch over to my other account here. So give me one second. Okay, does anyone have any questions or concerns uh, with respect to the PowerPoint? Uh, Farah, I see you have your hand up, so you're the first person. Okay. Farah, are you there? I'm sorry, I just unmuted myself. Okay. okay. Um, sorry, I just want to make a comment that we have been... Um, working closely with the Breen, Tommy Breen brothers and following up on that Shore Road study. We've been keeping on top of DOT for, I wanna say over a year and a half now, cause mm -hmm. they were supposed to have this done already. So uh, they said they are working on it. Unfortunately, COVID happened and delayed everything. But again, and you're right, I do reiterate, if you have suggestions, comments, things, as far as safety and things you want done, definitely reach out to me and to our office so we can advocate mm -hmm. for that as well. 
Yeah, we're going to be sending a letter from all the groups and the council member will, of course, be copied on that with all our elected officials, the senator, uh, the assembly, everyone. And so we'll actually include the PowerPoint as we do that, too. But thank you. You're right. Everyone should reach out to all their elected officials, including the councilman. Um, does anyone else have a question with respect to the to the presentation itself? Kim, go ahead. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to um, kind of accentuate the lack of safety at that um, crossing because I've been there several times where I've stopped because it is a law to stop when people are crossing at that crossing. And the people coming in the opposite direction just speed right through. So you end up with a situation where somebody is stuck in the middle and you know, one side is trying to do the right thing and get them, you know, safely across. And then the people coming in the other side, um, you know, are just ramming right through there and not even paying attention. So it's like making it almost like less safe. They would really be better off waiting until no cars are there at all. And then um, the other thing I noticed is that it's very dark. The area is extremely dark at night. So if people mm -hmm. are coming back from a bike, you know, bike ride and they're getting in that evening time, there's no lighting in that area. So um, I feel like I'm a pretty safe driver. I don't really speed, um, but I find that those little things that stick up, I forget what they're called, um, they're hard to see even mm -hmm. in the dark there, cause the reflectors only work if there's some kind of light source nearby. So it really is very unsafe. And I'd say that this is like this, that exact spot with all of the construction and going on. I mean, I think this is really an emergency situation. Um, if any of the elected representatives and, and their people are on there, I really, I really feel strongly. We have people coming from all over the Bronx, riding their bikes and, and coming through the park. And this is, it's it's very unsafe. And it's not a surprise to me at all that we've had the two, the two relatively recent deaths that we've had because you have the combination of very um, fast drivers on that straightaway. And then you have people that are kind of confused by the by the bike lanes and the bike situations caused by the traffic, by the um, construction. And it's just really a recipe for disaster. And the other thing I see is children. Um, sometimes people, you know, like kids who are in that younger age where maybe they don't have the best judgment yet, but they're off on their own. You know, they should be able to safely cross the street at a crossing. Um, parents should be able to send their kids out to, on a bike ride um, and if those if those kids are doing the right thing, they should be able to get across the street safely. So that's my two cents. Sorry, guys. that was great. No, no, that going was off. <laughs> I agree. I think every I saw a lot of nodding of the head. So I think everyone agreed with what you had to say. Um, the one thing I would say is when I spoke to the DOT commissioner, Commissioner Lopez, he did tell me that they are in the middle of doing a lighting study for the lighting within the park, because they recognize it's a serious problem. They've been getting complaints about it forever. I will say I was actually, you know, five years ago, it was even worse than it was now. At that point, there were 50 lights out within the park. Uh, last month, I went out and just double checked it. There are about 10 to 15 lights out now, which is still not great, but better than we were. So hopefully they will, uh, they will get to that. But thank you for everything you said there. And when you said in the beginning, you were talking about a crossing where it's unsafe. Was there a particular crossing or were you just speaking generally about all the crossings? The two crossings, um, you know, on the other side of the bridge from City Island that have the little orange things. The ones that they put yeah. in rather recently, but they Road. kind of, they, you know, for lack of better term, they did like a half-assed job of it. And so it's just kind of crappy, like... I think they knew they had to put something, so they did, but they put like the least possible thing that they could. And it's just, there's too many, there's too many things going on there that make it unsafe. Right, and just to add to that, um, one of the things that they've done is the crossing that's at the foot of the bridge that's always been there, now has giant signs in front of it. So a car, if there's somebody waiting to cross, cause I actually almost got hit on a run the other day, if somebody's waiting to cross, the cars that are coming toward City Island, toward the bridge, can't see the people because there's now like barricades up. 
that are right up against where the crosswalk is. So it's kind of working at cross purposes, I think. And, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, to Kim's point, um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, you know, it would be really easy, particularly for a child um, to, to not be seen because the barricades are, you know, uh, pretty, pretty tall and um, really block visibility from cars that might be coming, coming onto the, onto the island. Okay, good, good to know. Thank you for adding that. And I didn't even, you know, it's funny, I, I, I'm not even, that, that's a very good point because I'm not there on the pedestrian side to see it coming back. So that was really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Did, uh, Kevin, I saw you were going, but you were muted. Did you have something you wanted to say or add to the conversation here? Not necessarily, but what Kimberly said is true. And when they first um, uh, proposed those two crossovers by the construction, to get to the north side and then back to the south side, you know, me and a few other people showed major concern about it even before it was put up. We were assured of a few things and, you know, it was put up and it had the ballards up and, you know, we watched it. And it seemed like, you know, okay at the time. And it certainly John mentioned that they knocked down a couple of ballards uh, often, uh, a lot. But you mentioned lights and how, how bright or not bright that area might be. That may be something new for me to think about there. And then the other young lady, and I just miss, uh, forgot her name, mentioned that the corner coming around the circle as you enter that first crossover, if there's no daylighting, if there's something blocking the daylighting around that turn, it is pretty cross to that crossing. So mm -hmm. I like the word you use. It's an emergency. I think that's a priority on top of uh, the, uh, the the PowerPoint presentation. Something we yeah. brought up. Well, I want to just say the other thing I've noticed is that there are cars that stop for people on the crosswalk and then a car, a few cars behind gets into the fire line and comes zooming across the bridge. Um, yeah. It has to be something done about the people who speed on and off of City Island in the fire mm -hmm. lane. Yeah, some people use it as the uh, residence only lane and that's the illegal lane too, which they need to realize. Um, I agree with you, Nancy, wholeheartedly, and we will we will make a note of that. Um, Amelia, you had your hand up. I want to give you a second to ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so glad that we're discussing this today. Um, one issue that I noticed that's related to pedestrian safety when you come off the Pelham Bridge, and like you know, with the twenty nine turns, and you make the turns to go on to the island, there's been a, an uptick of people parking there. Yeah. And I guess they're parking there because they want to go fishing at that little cove. Mm -hmm. um, something needs to be done about that. I don't know what, because I think parks uses it for utility purposes, mm -hmm. um, but that's getting absolutely ridiculous. Um, another thing that I noticed, um, there's been dumping like mm -hmm. garbage near um, exit five off the Hutchins River Parkway, like where the, the bike path um, parallels the exit ramps off and on the Hutch. Mm -hmm. um, most of the big stuff gets taken care of, but like it doesn't seem to stop. I don't know why there's always something there. It's like- a Where is this again? Problem. I'm sorry. Like um, when you're coming off, the hutch southbound and you loop around you cross back over the hutch mm -hmm. to get onto orchard beach road mm -hmm. um i can send you a picture and like a, a map of what i'm talking about yeah, like sure. it's near oh, where, yeah it's near where the greenway crosses the entrance ramp to the hutch you emailed it to me or you, you send it to I, me I'll, i will uh, yeah no thank you for that because uh, amelia uh she's frequently in the park so you're you're a good Always. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Okay, Roy, Roy, I saw you had your hand up. I want to give you the opportunity to ask your question or comment, concern. Okay, I think I have I gotten off. And I like your I like your background. I just have to oh. point that out as you as you go here. Okay. Did I did I manage to unmute myself? You did. You succeeded. Okay. Um, so one of the frustrating things, you mentioned lighting. Um, one of the sort of perennial frustrating things is if you try to report an issue um, either by calling 311 
or by going to one of the various apps. Um, all of them, the 311 operators and the apps, they want to know the street address. You can't yes. report a light that's out if you don't have a street address. And, you know, you go back and forth with them. We're like, there is no street address. You know, it's the road through the park, you know, and it's, it's you know, the intersection by the riding stables, whatever. So, you know, there needs to be some mechanism to be able to report issues without having a, a house number. Yeah, no, you're so absolutely. You're right. not in your head. You're you're familiar with this. Oh, I, I, you know, I, 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 yes, I'm very familiar with. Trust me, for those pothole complaints, it was a, a little bit of a three one one tug or war to get them to take the three one one complaint. So I, I feel your pain in, in a very real sense of that. <laughs> um, absolutely, I, I'm getting a lot in on the chat as well. So I know people are are, um, are sharing their their views. Does anyone else have anything they want to say? related to the presentation that hasn't been touched on that you would like to see added? Cause I'm gonna run this by Kevin and um, uh, Kevin and our other partners in the, it, with transportation alternatives. And I'm also gonna run it through uh, Nilka Martell, who if none of you know, she's the president of the Pelham Bay Park uh, group. And she does a really great job. Um, and as well as Daniel from transportation alternatives, cause we wanna kind of put something together with everyone's voice on it. And along with the PowerPoint, a letter will go out probably tomorrow. So, you know, everyone gets everything very clear. And, and as, as, um, as Farah pointed out, and as Andy has, has put in the chat, we're gonna send it to our elected officials. Uh, Andy, I know when the Senator joined us two months ago, she did express interest in wanting to be a part of this. So let her know. I, I actually, the PowerPoint only got its finishing touches on like today. So we have not been holding back anything. It just, we haven't had, you know, this is the first meeting of the year. So we're getting used to everything. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to bring up regarding the park and safety that hasn't been touched on by either Kim, Beverly, Kevin, Nancy, Amelia, or Roy? Can you hear me? Yes. So is the City Island Bridge part of the park or not? Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it, it's DOT, DOT usually DOT. DOT. I'm sorry, go ahead, Fair. Yeah, no, it is. It's DOT, the bridge. Uh, yeah. The park has the property right on the fringe of it, but DOT is responsible for the bridge. I was really surprised at how badly, uh, how bad the snow was on the bridge for people that have to walk over the bridge in the snowstorm uh, last month. It wasn't, it wasn't plowed or shoveled at all. And I saw people trying to walk through the snow. It's terrible. Yeah, it was awful for like four or five days. I mean, it didn't it didn't go away until it melted. Really, it was awful, just terrible. But that's because the bridge was built, and they're still doing construction on the sewers and the water mains. And so, when you report a problem to them about the bridge, they say to the construction people, they say it's wow. not our problem because we can completed it and it belongs to DOT. And when you report it to DOT, they say, oh, they're still doing construction. So it's their problem. So there is no one owning up for responsibility for that. Understood. Because I've reported several things. The orange meshing that twists in people's feet when they walk across the bridge. And I've been told by both entities that it's the other's responsibility, which means the bridge is no one's responsibility. Fabulous. That's great to know. All right, so, so this is a good example of us working with the council member and the senator and the assembly member and everyone else and we're you know, kind of liaisoning because there, it, it shouldn't be jurisdictional hot potato. But later on, when I speak about the bridge, uh, the, the boat that's attached to the bridge, that's exactly what it's going to be. And they're all going to have to agree with me because I know every, I, I have gotten by every means of communication, including many of you stopping me on the street, I know that there's a boat on the bridge. I, I, and I'm going to go into that just real quickly here. Uh, DOT knows there's a boat on the bridge, but the boat as of right now is not affecting the, uh, the sturdiness of the bridge or any sort of operations of the bridge. Uh, NYPD Harbor Patrol knows that there is a boat on the bridge, but it is not within their jurisdiction to remove said boat from where it is. Right. The Harbor Patrol knows that there is a boat on the bridge, but it is not in the navigational waterway. So as such, they, it is not within their jurisdiction to remove that. Uh, 
sanitation understands that there is a boat on the bridge, but they think it's parks jurisdiction. So I have to follow up with the parks department. And then finally, believe it or not, the Small Business Services Administration of the city of New York has a harbor unit, and I'm waiting to hear back from their guy as well. So between SBS or parks, it's probably something we're going to have to deal with. I know in the past, the city usually contracts out through the city council to remove the boats after the fact as they've like floated onto the waterways. We've seen that happen in the past. Uh, you know, first Jimmy Vacca did it, then obviously council member Joe and I picked up that and kept going with it, which we appreciate. But this is a unique situation where it is literally attached to the bridge. Right. So I, I just bring it up because I am aware of that one as well. Another jurisdictional hot potato, we are working on it. Uh, as you can see, I, I'm, it, it's, 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 inter it's an interesting dilemma. And the community board knows there's a boat on the bridge. And John, I think one of those times you said Harbor Patrol twice, but you meant U.S. Coast Guard. Yes. Uh, so you've you've even you've even talked to federal agencies about this one. And oh, yeah. uh, I'm taking it. Fed. Yeah. And we are actually we talked about this at a past meeting, and unfortunately, the the, you know, the to do list gets long from these meetings. Sometimes some things take a little bit further to get on to others, but um, in the state of Georgia, they actually have legislation where they flag off an area with a buoy at the state level. The state then searches the VIN number and tells the person who owns the boat, remove the boat or we're gonna suspend your license. And surprise, surprise, after a short period of time, the boat gets removed. So I'm gonna be speaking to our state folks because we, we probably need something like that because this is falling. The city takes care of it once it reaches landfall, uh, someone gets it. And if it's in a navigational waterway, the feds, the Coast Guard does address it, but otherwise we're left in we're left in boat purgatory. And the bridge may be boat purgatory right now. So I I it is it is uh, again, I'm I'm working on it. I'm I'm trying. I'm trying to work on it. Um so beyond that, we have some other things to get to this evening. Hey John. Yes. One last thing that I wanted to ask about, which mm -hmm. was Throughout, throughout the park, there are so many areas on the roads where the, the, uh, the foliage has grown over mm -hmm. and it's not cut back. And so it actually makes the lanes that much more narrow mm -hmm. and the visibility is bad. Um, and I guess that's, that's, um, that's, that's the parks department job. Yeah. I mean, Unfortunately, the maintenance schedules have been kind of cut, I think. I don't know if it's a COVID-related expense, but I, I know it took a meeting at the community board of a few of our elected officials, uh, right the median, right by where you reach the interstate, where you make the turn onto the interstate. Remember that was like a jungle for a little while? Right. And they had to like literally call in everybody into a meeting in the community board for someone to eventually take responsibility and then cut the grass. So I agree it's... I mean, if there's specific areas, we can ask our elected officials or we can reach out to the Parks Department to, to maintain those areas. Right now, my, my other big bugaboo is Lake Orchard Beach, which there's an article on the Bronx Times website about, and we're working to get attention on because literally by the entryway of Orchard Beach, that goes down to one lane because we have now the Bronx's ice skating rink because it is literally moved onto the roadway, which is interesting, but um, enough on that. Uh, thank, thank you for everything that you do, John. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. For what you do. Well, thank thank me once the boat is gone. Now, then then I'll, I'll accept it. Until that point, no, I, I appreciate that, but that's not necessary. So um, we're going to go right to community updates. Uh, and this will be from all the members of the board. Uh, the first one I'm going to bring up is just we've gotten a ton of face masks, face shields. If you're wondering what a face shield is, I took the liberty of getting one of these, so you can all see. These are free. Uh, you can't have this one, obviously, because it's contaminated now. But I have 499 other ones that we can give out to you. So please, um, you go to C C I Rising Face uh, Bitly C I Rising Face Mask. It's on our both our social media channels. Just scroll a little bit down. I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, we have face masks. We have face shields. We have uh, hand sanitizer. We're still trying to beat COVID. So if you need these things, David Diaz and I were out last night dropping it off in people's mailboxes. But you know, keep it coming. We ha still have a ton of supplies here. 
and we want to be helpful to you. Uh, and we've all got to stick together here. Uh, second thing is uh, the MTA is having a board meeting in January. And this is, uh, you know, we've held off on really pushing the MTA, but now that it looks like there's going to be a big uh, infrastructure package coming through the federal government to the state level, now's the time that we as a small little community of 4,500 people got to start raising our voices. And um, the meeting is Thursday morning on the 21st. So if you're interested, please email me. If you've been to a past be it Bronx 29 bus meeting, uh, I have your email, but just email me regardless. We're gonna all sign up to speak at the MTA board meeting to remind them that they made a pledge to this community over 18 months ago that the Bronx 29 bus after five years of us complaining and showing up to meetings would go 24 seven. So that we're gonna ask the MTA to keep their promise to us. So I need all of you to come with me and it's, it's not just, they're probably tired of hearing my voice. I'm tired of hearing my voice too, even tonight, but it is about all of us coming together and speaking in, in one unison sound that we want the bus to run 24 seven. Um, three, if you're very interested in climate change, the mayor's office of climate resiliency has reached out. They wanna do a round table of kind of people who are really interested in this from city island. So somewhere between a dozen to 20 people if you're interested, email me, please. We need a lot of people to show up to that, to talk about what our resiliency needs are from, uh, you know, kind of where, when it's, when it's moon tide and half a block goes underground to drainage issues, to uh, Lake now ice skating rink, Orchard Beach, uh, all those things need to be addressed. And this is a good way to start that dialogue. Um, through the 45th Precinct Council, we're gonna be doing another Narcan training. It's gonna be, February 8th from 7 to 8 p.m. It's totally free of charge. You get a free Narcan. You keep it, you put it in your wallet, put it in your car, put it in your purse, and you may just be able to save a life. And we all know someone who's grappled with addiction and it's a serious public health issue. And then finally, and I don't wanna go into it too deep this evening. Well, we can if people want to, uh, there's probably going to be something coming up in Albany to make some of these speed cameras 24-7. Uh, many of you have opined and communicated to me, you know, last year we worked very hard to get the speed camera that was put up on the avenue. It is not 24-7. Uh, our elected officials helped with that. Some of them have been Adetto, Senator Biagi, they, they added their voices. And, uh, but it, it runs from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. only on weekdays. So if you want it 24-7, please reach out to Senator Biaggi, please reach out to Assemblymember Benedetto, tell them you live on City Island and you think that this would be helpful with some of our summer traffic problems. Uh, also super important. And uh, that can, uh, does anyone else on the board have a uh, community concern? Beverly, Kim, anybody? No, good. Louisa just texted, she had to jump off. We're gonna be arranging a tutorial about ranked choice voting because this year for the city races, you're not gonna be voting one, uh, you know, one or the other. You're gonna be voting you know, uh, on, a, on a ranked of one to five, what your choices are. So we're gonna be doing a whole tutorial on that, uh, which is good and teaching everybody how to use ranked choice voting. So when you go into the ballot box, your vote counts. Um, Kim, do you have anything from the treasurer's report? Um, sure, I can give Thank you. a brief update. Um, we currently have uh, approximately $1,400 in our account. Um, we, we did recently have a Giving Tuesday fundraiser. Our fundraiser was to raise money for other local organizations on the island. Um, those were the East, Ch East Chester Bay Stray Cat Project. Um, they've had a lot of expenses associated with cat rescues on the island, vet bills, things like that. Um, and then the PS 175 PTA, they've also had a short fall due to um, lack of fundraising ability this year. Um, so we raised um, $520 for those two organizations, which we'll be distributing to them when we get that money um, from, from Facebook. It was a Facebook fundraiser. 
And then we have an upcoming expense um, for our insurance, um, which is $714 for the year. Um, so we will be dipping below $1,000. Um, and so, you know, as a, as an organization for the community, um, we don't we don't collect dues, we don't require dues, but if anybody um, you know is able to donate a few dollars to us, um, we would appreciate any kind of um, money that you can send our way just to help us with things like our um, you know even our Zoom license and just things like that to to keep us up and running. Um, we do have a PayPal account, and I'll put that in the chat. Um, if you don't have PayPal, feel free to reach out to me um, at my email. Um, I'll put that in, oops, I just sent that only to Beverly, which is not very useful. I know how to find the PayPal account. <laughs> and then um, I can put my Gmail address here as well. Um, you can contact me if you know if you want to do a donation in some other way. Um, you, you know, as I, I've told people, we will we will find a way. If you have money to give us, we will find a way. We take any kind of money in any kind of form. Um, so if PayPal doesn't work for you, for you, please let me know. But again, you know, all this all this stuff does take money, and the more that we are able to raise, um, the more that we can do to help our community. Can I just add to your plug, Kim? So, yes. you know, we made a decision when we started this organization um, uh, a couple of years ago now that we were not going to charge dues because we didn't want to create any barriers to entry to people who wanted to participate in making the community a better place. That said, um, it, you know, as 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 Kim said, um, if you do wish to make a contribution, um, we would deeply appreciate it um, and and help support help support the organization to continue in a way that doesn't require um, the payment of dues in order to be able to participate in uh, meaningful conversations to make our community a better place. So thanks everybody. And then Beverly, can you just uh, tell everybody how they can, uh, you know, kind of what the yeah. process would be? Absolutely. So um, we are speaking of participation and not having barriers to entry. Um, we are a self-perpetuating board that always is looking for new members. Um, so if you have an interest in serving on um, the board of City Island Rising um, uh, and helping to um, craft the agendas and 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 organize these conversations, um, we would love to have you. Um, drop me a line. I will put my um, uh, email address in the chat. Um, and um, we we sort of have two different bodies. So we have um, a steering committee um, where uh, you can um, be a little bit more flexible coming in and out. And then we have a board um, uh, which, uh, you know, we, we do have meetings about once a month, a little bit less than that. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that we, we really bring everybody together and both of these two bodies, um, can, uh, pretty much participate on, on equal footing. Um, if you are interested in participating in either of those, whether it's just dipping your toe in as part of the steering committee or jumping in with both feet to be part of the board, um, please do let us know we're having, um, elections, I think in, April, if I'm remembering correctly how we wrote our bylaws. Um, but uh, we really um, do appreciate, uh, you know, having having more voices at the table and being able um, to to um, uh, bring bring additional additional folks and additional voices into the conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Beverly, for that. And again, please get in touch with Beverly. We want you. I'm not going to do a uh, Photoshop of me on Uncle Sam, but we want you to join. If you can, we always need more voices. You know, we want a board that's as diverse, you know, in background, wh whatever background, you know, age, ethnicity, gender, ethnic group, you know, something that is truly reflective of City Island. And that means, you know, inviting people to the table and, you know, us all working together because the more people we have at the table, first off, it's less work for everyone, which is good because some of us are doing a lot. And then also it's a, uh, you know, diversity of thought is educational. Sometimes we all have blind spots, we all have biases, and the more people we have at the table with unique backgrounds, the more we're hearing of things that maybe I don't think about, Beverly, Kim, what have you, 
we think about, so we definitely want more voices. And we have some good news. Uh, one of the purchases we just made uh, that Kim got to in our expenditures, I'm gonna share with everybody because this is gonna be a fundraising item for us. Hold on. We are gonna have tote bags. As, as Nicole just said, by PBS viewers like you. So we're gonna have these tote bags. They're gonna be coming in in uh, about a week's time. So we're gonna be selling them out in the neighborhood for $10, uh, you know, small expenditure. Uh, and we're gonna just be asking, if you wanna give more, you're welcome to give more, but we're asking suggested price, $10. It's good for the environment. You need these tote bags anyway, because they're charging you for those plastic bags, uh, which is a cause of our uh, community. And it's a good way of showing people uh, about our organization, at least getting them uh, to want to look us up and learn more about us. So thank you for that. Um, does anyone have anything in old business at a past meeting that we have not discussed that you want to bring up now? Okay. Uh, does anyone have anything in new business? that they would like to bring up now. I know it's been a long meeting. Um, the one thing we did want to, and I'm gonna get right to you, uh, assembly member. The one thing we did want people to know is that we're considering doing, when, when we're kind of a little bit out of the woods on COVID, either an in-person meeting or activity. It might be a walk. It, we're, we're going back and forth as a group, but we bring this because, you know, there, there was at one point almost 40 people on this call. We're bringing this and people, a lot of people do watch this after the fact. If you have an idea for something that would be a fun, socially distant group activity, whether it's walking in the woods or what have you, we would love to do something that, you know, kind of brings people together to explore the community and gets the, uh, the good ideas going and everything else. So if you have any good ideas on anything, you know, email us, city island rising one word, at gmail.com. Uh, that's my last plug for the evening. So we're going to go to elected official report. And first elected official is somebody who's not technically our elected official, but right next door. And that's Assemblywoman Fernandez, who has been kind enough to be with us the entire meeting. So Natalia, take it away, please. Thank you so much. Um, I'm right next door, but I'm a big fan of City Island. So that just needs to be thrown out there. And I really got to start by commending this group, John, uh, Kimberly, Beverly, everyone on here, the conversation is so substantial with really hyper local details that have solutions. And, you know, I'm taking notes here because the reason why I'm sitting here, I want to really learn what are the, the hyper local issues of City Island. As everyone says, you're a world, not a world away from the Bronx, but you're a different world. And it's a beautiful little world. And it's one that has specific needs. So for those that don't know, I'm just going to be, you know, full transparent. I'm running for Bronx Borough President, and I want to really get to the nitty gritty of every community to address these issues and really get some serious answers. So I've been following for a while. I know Shore Road is a problem, the, the flooding that's happening. It seems like a simple solution. Why DOT just doesn't level it out? So I hope to, to be able to address that on a grander level, but I will co-sign everything that the current elected officials are doing over there because I know they're working hard on it from Senator Biagi to Assemblyman um, Benedetto and Councilman Joni. So I do give them great credit for um, all the work that they do on City Island. And I do wanna share to please stay tuned to my campaign. Um, I am officially running the elections in June. So ranked choice voting. I will be hosting a few uh, forums myself on that. I will be jumping on to other forums just to not to show my face, but also give my opinion on it. And I think it is um, certainly a, a method of voting that really makes every vote count. It gives every vote its value. And I think that's really important because how many times have we felt like, oh, why should I have voted when my person didn't even win? But this really does give substance and teeth to the vote. So I'm excited to see it go. Um, but to stay tuned for my Bronx Green Plan, economic justice, I mean, uh, environmental justice is very important. And I have a vision to make the, the borough of the Bronx the greenest borough of the Bronx. And we can certainly set a standard in how we address climate change, flooding, and for, uh, again, hyperlocal issues, our coastal issues um, and worries that we have. I really want to make sure that we are addressing everything that has been brought up here and continue to empower your voices because 
you know, it was 40 people at one point, and this might be a small new group, but you really are making an impact in addressing the small things for the longer run that can make it a great achievement. So thank you so much for letting me listen. Uh, I was really happy to learn. And I love that idea about a community event. I don't know about you guys, but this summer when it was, you know, super quarantine and I had a little free time, I really enjoyed visiting every park that we had in the Bronx and Pelham Bay Park was, and is my favorite. So if you do do some sort of outside activity, I absolutely uh, would love to be a part of that. And Kevin, I saw you put up a little bike there. And yeah. that is part of my green plan to make <laughs> sure that we have better transportation options and safer options. And that's cute green, green bronze, green, green bike. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me. Please stay tuned. Um, my, for, uh, uh, my website is up, fernandez2021.com. Uh, you will see me again, if not on here, on the island. And please ask the questions that you want to hear answers for. Give me suggestions of what you want to see for your Bronx, your neighborhood. I'm not doing this for anybody else, but the borough of the Bronx, and that includes you. So thank you so much and happy new year. Thank you, Assembly Member, for coming and for sitting through the meeting. Um, we have two elected official reps. I know they've both spoken, but we're going to give them the opportunity. Anything else they want to announce? Andy, uh, do you have anything you'd like to announce on behalf of Senator Biaggi? Well, thank you, John, so much for having uh, us tonight. And when I heard that you and City Island Rising did a lot of great work, uh, you don't disappoint. So um, I'm really glad to meet all of you. I'm Senator Biaggi's Constituent Services Director. Um, as uh, Assemblywoman Fernandez knows, they uh, are back in session, uh, but not in Albany. Um, so, and Senator Biagi was very proud to be leading the effort in co-sponsoring the latest round of the relief uh, packages that extended the eviction moratorium to May 31st um, as well. So hopefully with the uh, change in administrations coming um, next week on the federal level, there'll be more relief to come. We've been very steeped in the um, COVID uh, vaccine and testing, uh, you know, sites, as I know, uh, the Assemblywoman and Assemblyman Benedetto and Councilman Joe Nye's office has been as well and getting, bringing more mobile testing sites to the Bronx, uh, as well as trying to get vaccines uh, sites approved. Uh, the governor, the vaccine rollout has been a bit of a mess to say the least. Um, some people are getting, uh, appointments, mostly senior citizens. The governor uh, announced on Tuesday he was changing the age from 75 to 65 and up, which is what most states uh, are doing. So some people were able to get appointments, but others uh, not because they just don't have enough, either they don't have enough doses and they just don't have enough testing uh, uh, vaccine sites set up yet. So we're working with Community Board 10 to try to bring uh, some in the East Bronx. I know one of them was Lehman High School where we requested uh, one. So we'll hope to have some follow-up for you um, uh, on that soon and get this more resolved. But um, other than that, um, we're here for you. I know I mentioned I was uh, cognizant of Michael's presentation and I'm happy to re relay that to my legislative colleagues uh, in Albany and uh, as well as you know the DOT uh, issues. It's been a, a Bronx-wide and even beyond, of course, you know, issue with traffic and pedestrian safety. Uh, I know in the neighboring uh, community in Morris Park, their News 12 has done several stories about it. And uh, that has, um, you know, sort of lit the fire for DOT to do take more action. So we've been happy to see some improvements, but a lot still need to be made. And, um, you know, so I'm happy to uh, be here and continue to work uh, on those issues and uh, be talking to you guys many times again. I left my email and phone number in the chat. So whatever you need, we're here for you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Andy. And we'll be reaching out to you on the boat stuff because this boat is, there were two boats. That, I'm not gonna get into the boat thing again. I think everyone heard enough about the boat thing. Uh, Farah, are you still on? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you, Farah. Okay. Um, yes, as Ann, uh, I'm sorry, Andy, nice to see you. Um, I look forward to working with you more in the future. Um, I tried to put in the chat a couple of things. Number one, I did want to mention that the councilman is working on discussing having the infrastructure put underground, you know, okay. for utilities. And it's a big project, but he has started the process of putting in legislation for it and seeing what can be done. 
Um, the other thing I did put in the chat also is that if you are a 501c3 organization and would like to apply for discretionary funding that are, um, the deadline is February 16th and I did attach the link into the chat. If you do have any questions or just wanna reach out, do, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or our office. Uh, we are always there and um, can always follow up and try to help you with any of your issues. Also, we are working, as you know, we've been doing several, you know, food, mask, hand sanitizer giveaways throughout the year. Uh, we also, have been doing um, the testing, mobile testing as well. And we are working on new dates and new testing sites, as well as hopefully getting some vaccine testing done, as well as um, getting rapid testing done, because we don't want to have people wait for their results. Um, and I think that was all. I know I'm forgetting one thing, but I'll let it go at that. It's nice to see everyone and happy new year. <laughs> and that, that was a lot of information. So if you're only forgetting one thing, you, you supplied us with a lot of other stuff. Uh, the one thing, uh, Farah, if you could ask the council member, I had a discussion with him. Um, I know he's very dedicated to um, uh, traffic mitigation on the island and dealing with that. And I know that's a problem every year and trying to think of some outside the box solutions given the budget and NYPD and everything is where it is. I know he has some suggestions. He and I, it's given him some paperwork. If you could just follow up with him and see what, you know, where he is with that. I know he was looking it over and thinking of, you know, that in line with his own ideas, because we would like to in work with him. To DOT, you mean? or in Yeah, department? yeah. Like one thing was like okay. the parking, right? When you come onto the islands, an issue that kind of leads to a bottleneck. Another thing was possibly doing a bus lane on City Island Road. I know I gave him a lot of the documents. If you could just follow up with him and I'll work with you and you know, we'll, we'll put, you know, we'll figure something out. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much, Fair. Does anyone have any questions for our elected officials since we have them all? Uh, oh, I, yeah, I, Andrea. I, I have a comment, uh, I guess to, to Andy. I, I'm a healthcare person, so I was able to get like my first oh. vaccine and hopefully, and I have a schedule for my second. Uh, some of the problems that are coming up that you may know about, but I, I you probably know about, but I, I mentioned is that like Mount Sinai today canceled a bunch of appointments. And I think what they said, I, I'm sort of affiliated with Sinai was they didn't get the supplies they expected. Okay, so that's an issue. And some friends of mine went to sites and I was very nervous when I went and got my ex thing that this would happen and they weren't given a second appointment. So now how are they gonna get that second thing? So I think, you know, I'm telling my friends like, call your congressman or your assemblyman or do something because that's, I mean, that would be very disturbing to me. When I went to get my shot, my most, I'm not anxious about the shot, but I'm thinking, are they gonna give me a second appointment? And now I'm thinking like, will they be able to give me my shot at my second appointment? Cause are they gonna get the supplies they're expected? So it's very anxiety provoking. Even if you do get shots, it's all, it's still chaotic and disturbing. So just thought I'd mention those things. You know, thank you. That's very helpful, um, you know, feedback to have. We did hear about um, Mount Sinai. That was very unfortunate. Um, and a lot of people have been getting it through pr the private hospital systems, which not everybody can, uh, you know, of course do. So I think the more that, uh, the more doses that we get in, uh, especially from the, the federal level and the more sites we get approved, Hopefully that's something that, that's going to improve and things yep. coming out of the governor's office are changing every day. Also, hopefully with the new administration, there'll be more reliability and predictability. So if they tell you you're gonna get a certain number of doses, you'll the hospital Actually, get, it. get them. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrea. Go ahead, Kim. Um, just one other comment about the vaccine. I went to get the vaccine the other day and I had a good experience. There was a very long line. Um, but one of the things I noticed about the line is I don't mind, I don't mind standing in a line, um, but there were a lot of older people in the line. And um, I really think that if if a 70 something, 80 something, 90 something year old person is going to get the vaccine, that they should get some special treatment. 
um, in the line. I don't mind um, waiting a little longer if I can see that those people, I really feel like if you're gonna have one of these big hubs, you know, have a line for um, the older people who maybe can't, can't stand in the cold for an hour or longer, um, get those people in or at least get them in a place where they can sit um, rather than having them stand in the line because I don't think that's right. I mean, I'm, I'm in my 40s, I'm fine. Standing in the line, many of the people in the line were other people, um, you know, younger people who, who have jobs and that was their eligibility status. But um, I think we need to do more to help our older people to get the vaccine faster and um, without discomfort. Where did you get your vaccine? Where did you have a line? Can I, ask? Um, I was at the hub at um, St. Anne's Place, the South Bronx Educational Campus. Yeah. Okay. The line was very long. I think they're over scheduling, to tell you the truth. I don't think they should be scheduling as many people as they are. But so, I was thankful to get it. So I got my appointment and I got my vaccine. So I was very thankful and I didn't mind standing in a line. Um, to change the subject just a bit, I just want to remind everybody, um, so City Island Rising is a 501c3 organization, um, which means that we cannot um, support or oppose any candidate for public office. Um, and uh, so organizationally, we make no um, uh, endorsements or, or uh, support or oppose any, any candidate for public office, just to make that clear. Thank you, Beverly. Beverly did all the work to get us 501c3 status and uh, we are determined not to lose that status. So Wait, I wanna thank her. She's also the enforcer who keeps the rest of us on our toes, which is very good as, I, I mean that in the best possible way. You make way. me sound so evil, John. No, I mean that I mean that in a nice way. I'm so, I'm so, it did come out, I, I apologize. I, I, I'm a big fan of Beverly's. Uh, okay. I'm not trying to say anything to the contrary. Okay. And um, you know, what we're trying to do is we have a lot of candidates for office, some of which you've heard from tonight. And we're trying to just integrate them so you guys as voters can make that distinction. But as Beverly rightfully pointed out, rising is not going to endorse one way or another, but we invite anyone who's running for office or anyone in any other community can come in, listen to our meetings, these go on Facebook and learn about our issues. The whole thing is to inform people about City Island. So that way we're doing effective advocacy when, when things come down. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add, because he just texted me, is David Diaz is working very hard to get on a grant proposal uh, for us to help with um, some of the food inequities that are going on. And you probably all know David Diaz because he's been running halfway around the Bronx delivering food to this one, that one, and the third. So uh, he's working hard. And through if we get this grant, we'll be working hard with him to continue the food and all the other great work Ariadna or everyone else is doing. Uh, since it is nine o'clock, uh, I just wanted a last call. Does anyone have a community question they want to bring up in this forum? Keep in mind, you can always uh, message us, uh, Beverly, Kim, myself, David, uh, Louisa, other members of the board, totally willing to do that. But if anyone has anything else they'd like to add at this point in the meeting, speak now or forever hold your peace. I can say that because I'm a minister. Internet I, minister. I, I just posted the link uh, for any that arrived late and they didn't get to see the presentation about the community fridge. I dropped a link in the chat for any folks that wanted to follow up with us and weren't able to see the uh, the presentation. Thank you so much. Great, can you email that to me? Cause I'll put it, we'll, we'll, we'll clip it and we'll put it on our Facebook too and our social media. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I want to, uh, I want to thank uh, Ariadna for her presentation. I want to thank Michael for his presentation. I want to thank uh, Andy, Farah, uh, Assemblywoman Fernandez. I want to thank all the people who contributed tonight. So that's, uh, you know, Kevin, Nancy, Amelia, Roy, Ellen. Um, I'm probably, for, uh, Andrea, I'm probably forgetting a name or two, uh, but I want to thank everybody for their contributions. Uh, this was a great meeting, uh, very well organized. And um, if you have any questions or concerns, reach out, we're here for you. And we'll do this all again next month. And remember, if you want to join our board, Reach out to Beverly Jones. She'll Come help join you. the board. Come join the board. Thank you so very much. Cityislandrising at gmail.com. Good night, everybody. Night, everybody.